Hey everyone, it's Mark and I'm back with another flight sim video and with the recent releases of classic airplanes like the Comanche, the BAE-146 and a bunch of other ones, I thought it might be a good time to start learning all about navigation without the aid of a GPS or an FMS or even any other type of moving map that's going to track your location. Today we're going to learn the basics and look at how to plan the route for this type of flight and in future videos we're going to look at how to navigate in the plane with VORs, how to fly instrument procedures without a GPS and most importantly how to find our way when we're lost. I'm not going to lie, flying with traditional navigation like this is challenging at first but once you get the hang of it it's a ton of fun and it keeps you way more involved with your flight because you have to constantly be tracking what you're doing. So if you want to take your simming experience to the next level make sure to stick around and let's go! Before GPS's and FMS's became standard, there was pretty much only one game in town when you wanted to navigate cross country, and that was based on a technology that you've likely already heard mentioned before called VORs. Each VOR is a station that's somewhere along the ground that emits a signal that we can pick up in the airplane, and we can use that to figure out where we are relative to the station, and then fly in a given direction to or from it. The way you pick up that signal is by tuning the frequencies on the instrument panel for either the NAV1 or the NAV2 radios, and each one of them can hold two different frequencies, one for the active VOR that you're tracking and another standby frequency that you can swap to really quickly whenever you need it. The NAV1 radio is what's going to drive our HSI that's right below the attitude indicator and the NAV2 radio is going to be shown on another instrument that's usually just to the right of the HSI but there are some exceptions to that especially when it comes to airliners. The HSI is actually two instruments in one. On the outside we've got the heading indicator which tells us what heading we're currently flying and on the inside we've got a top-down view of where the airplane is relative to the VOR that we're tracking. The other piece of information that most VORs give you is the distance that you are from them and on the airplane we can track that on an instrument called the DME or the distance measuring equipment. Sometimes the DME is going to be integrated into the nav radios like it is on the Comanche but oftentimes you'll have a completely separate instrument for it like we see on the Bonanza here and it even has a way to flip between the NAV1 radio and the NAV2 radio so that you can quickly tell how far you are from two different VORs. When you combine the directional information of the HSI with the distance information of the DME, it gives you the ability to fly certain waypoints on a chart that don't have a VOR, which is very typical in departure procedures, arrivals and approaches, and we're going to look at all of that in the planning section of the video. In terms of which airplanes are best for learning this stuff, ironically the Garmin units that come in most of the default airplanes are a great way to start because they have the nav radios that we need, the HSI, and a DME that you can bring up on the PFD as well. And since you've got the map right next to you, you can play around with the HSI to understand how it works with a VOR and just cross check your position on the map at the same time. Once you're ready to take it to the next level though, there are a lot of really nice options available now, with the most popular at the moment being the A2A Comanche, but you've also got the Piper lineup from Just Flight as well, the Black Square Analog lineup, and a couple of other options too. If you're more into turboprops and airliners because you want to fly a little bit faster, there are a couple of choices there now too, including the BAE-146, the F-28, and my personal favorite, the King Air, which we'll be looking at in our second flight in this series when we look at more airliner type routes. The thing that all of these airplanes have in common is they use the HSI as their main navigation instrument so you'll be able to follow along with these tutorials regardless of what you're flying because the HSI works the exact same way across all airplane types. The same can't be said for the default Cessna 152 or the 172 in the premium version. They have separate instruments for the heading and the VOR so they don't have an HSI and that actually makes a big difference because it can cause you to go in the wrong direction a lot more easily because of something called reverse sensing. You can definitely still use them for this first flight that we're going to be flying but if you have something else that's just a little bit faster or that has an HSI you'll probably be better off. 
We're going to look at all of the planning stuff in just a second, but I want to remind you to hit the like button if you haven't already and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on my next video. I publish a new one every two weeks with tips, tricks, and tutorials. And as well, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. I always do my best to answer everything that comes in. All right, so with all of that context, we are ready to plan a short IFR route, and I'm going to walk you through my process. And to be clear, this is not how you would do it in the real world, but it works well in flight sim, and you should be able to reproduce it with whatever flight that you want to plan. The flow that I use is different based on the type of airplane that I'm flying. So for airliners and turboprops, I'm going to start off in Simbrief because it's really good at recommending airliner type routes. But for a GA flight like we're planning today, I'm going to plan it myself in Navigraph instead just because Simbrief isn't quite as good at those types of flights. It all starts off by creating a new flight and then obviously we have to pick a departure and a destination. We're going to do a short hop in Southern California for this one, just because it's one of my favorite areas to fly. And I'm going to use Torrance as our origin. Its identifier is KTOA. And if we go into the runways for the departure, we're going to pick 29 left, just because we don't need that much length in our runway, because we're flying a small GA airplane. And the winds are coming in from the ocean today, so it makes sense to pick that one. For our destination, we're going to be flying to Oxnard, which is about 50 miles to the northwest. Its identifier is KOXR, in case you're looking for it. And I picked that one on purpose because it's going to give us a good variety of things that we can practice along the way, including flying to and from a couple different VORs. Once I add that to the route, it's now given us a straight line from point A to point B, and we could make that route work if we were flying this route with a GPS. But when we're flying with traditional navigation, our route's not going to be anywhere near as direct as this, unfortunately. And in fact, what we have to do to get there is very similar to what you would do if you were driving from one city to the other, and that's to hop on a highway or in this case, an airway. All of the solid black lines with numbers on them are different airways that run to and from all of the VORs in the area. And the VORs themselves are easily identifiable as well because they'll have a compass rose around them when you zoom in a little bit, as well as the name and frequency for that VOR. There are also two type of airways that you should know about. There's low IFR and high IFR, and you can toggle between them with the map layers near the top. And when you're flying with a GA airplane, you'll want to stick to the low IFR airways, which are what you use below 18,000 feet, and leave the high IFR airways for the turboprops and the airliners, which we'll look at again in another video. So the way that I figure out which airway I'm going to use is to actually work backwards from my destination. And I start by looking at what approaches are available for the runway that we're going to be using for landing. And in this case for Oxnard, if we go into it, we can see that we have three of them available for runway 25, an RNAV, an ILS, and a VOR approach. We can't fly the RNAV approach because we don't have a GPS, but we could do either the ILS or the VOR approach. And since the ILS is going to give us a lower decision altitude, I'm always going to check that one out first just to see what we've got. It looks pretty standard, but now that we don't have a GPS, we have to pay much closer attention to how we're going to get to the initial approach fix. And for this one, there are two different IAFs, one at the Fillmore VOR and another one at the Guybe waypoint. The Fillmore VOR is to the north of the final approach course, and since we're coming in from the southeast, the Guybe option would be a lot more convenient, but there's no VOR there, so we need to figure out how we can actually get to that waypoint. The way that we do that without a GPS is by flying from a VOR on a specific course and distance. So for example, on the right, it says that if we fly from the Van Nuys VOR on a course of 250 for 16 and a half miles, we'll be at the Guybe waypoint. And we can do that because we have the HSI to fly the right course and the DME to measure the distance that we traveled. I'm not going to use the Van Nuys transition for a different reason though, because if I close out the chart, you can see there's an airway that runs from Van Nuys down to Santa Monica in blue, which means it's an RNAV airway, but we don't have a GPS on board. So technically we're not supposed to use that one, even though we could in this case, because it's just going from one VOR to the other. 
The other option is that there's an airway from the Fillmore VOR that runs south through Guybe, and that's going in the general direction that we need to get back to Torin. So, so far it makes sense. And at the end of that airway, there's another one that goes east that we can jump on to get within a couple of miles of the airport. That should work out fine. So I'm going to confirm that by first choosing the final transition for runway 25 on the left. And now once I've done that, you can see it's highlighted the approach in orange, but it didn't include Guybe in the route. So I've got to add it manually by first clicking on it. And that's going to open a little context window on the left at the bottom where I can click add to route to add it to the rest of the approach. We also said that we'd fly down the airway from Guybe, and the easiest way to add that airway segment is to click at the other end of the airway at the SADI waypoint, or SAD, however you want to pronounce it. That'll bring up the context window again. I can click Add to Route on it. And now it's asking me where in the route I want to insert that waypoint. And since we're working backwards from our destination to our origin, I'm going to say that I want it before Guybe because we're going to be flying from here towards the initial approach fix. Then from there, we can either go to the Santa Monica VOR or the LAX VOR. And I'm going to pick Santa Monica just because it's a little bit further from our departure point and it'll make it a little bit easier to explain a couple of things along the way once we're flying the route, but you could realistically pick either one here. Again, all I have to do to add this airway segment is to click on the Santa Monica VOR, click on add to route, and now it's just asking me where to insert it. And in this case, we want it before SAD. Now there's still a gap in our route from our departure point to the Santa Monica VOR. That's okay though, even though there are some other airways that would probably bring us a little bit closer, we don't always need to fly on an airway. And the way I like to think of it is that that first leg from takeoff to the Santa Monica VOR is kind of like the on-ramp for the airway. The only thing that you need to be careful of though is that the VOR isn't too far away and that you can pick up the signal for it once you're airborne. So if we were to click on a VOR, in the properties that come up, there's a range value, and that's going to be either high altitude or low altitude. And you should be able to pick up the high altitudes from around 100 miles out and the low altitudes from 40 miles out. But picking up the signal from that edge of the range in Flight Sim seems to be a little bit hit or miss. So if you're planning to do a direct leg to the VOR, I'd probably say keep it under 40 miles or you might run into trouble. For this flight, if we have a look at the text route at the top, we can see that from the runway to the Santa Monica VOR, it's saying that it's going to be around 14 miles. So we'll be perfectly fine within our range that we were just saying. And with all of that, we've actually planned our full route now. And if we were planning a longer distance, all we would do is just repeat the exact same process that we did going from VOR to VOR on different airways until we got in range of our departure airport. Now that the planning part is done, we can focus more on the operational side of things in the airplane and how we actually fly the route and use the VORs in the airplane. Unfortunately though, that's going to be in the next episode. So make sure that you've liked the video and subscribe on your way out so that you don't miss out on that next one because we're going to have a whole lot of fun flying in the clouds.